If you want to play at the level of professional players, then you need to be able to make optimal decisions and calculations under immense pressure. And you need to be able to play with an aggressive playstyle while also maintaining smooth mechanics. And of course, you also need to be able to sustain your concentration for hours on end to train hard throughout the entire day. So how can you unlock the confident, aggressive playstyle of pro players? How can you make genius decisions and predictions while under pressure? And how can you maintain a state of pure focus for hours on end without getting tired? Well, you might not be able to do this without first changing your brain. Here's what I mean. Professional players can resist anxious thought patterns, process more information in their working memory, and stay focused without draining their energy. And they can do this because they essentially have more mental strength than you. It's kind of like having a stronger muscle. Those who have larger, stronger muscles can lift more weights without feeling overwhelmed, and they can do it for longer without getting tired. Similarly, those with more mental strength can resist more intense distractions and train for longer without getting tired. So if you want to train and perform like a pro, you need to start building some of that mental muscle. But when it comes to our brains, we can't just lift weights to build our cognitive strength. Which is why most of us assume things like our ability to focus or process information are uncontrollable. In other words, because there isn't a clear solution for improving our brains, we typically assume that our genetics and environments have limited our abilities. And quite honestly, a few generations ago, this was mostly true. Most people had no idea that their brains could be trained, and even those who did know it had no idea how to do it. But with more modern research and technology, we now have access to new ways of training our brains, which might just help us upgrade our mental muscle and achieve insane performance in the game. As you likely know, the activity in your brain determines how well you do in the game. It controls every aspect, from coordinating muscle memory to making decisions under pressure. But far beyond our performance in one specific domain like gaming, the human brain also controls everything that we do in our daily lives. So it's no surprise that humans have been curious about the brain's inner workings since ancient times. But of course, it's not exactly practical to just open up someone's skull and start poking around without causing some sort of damage. So for the majority of human history, our brains have been seen as this mysterious thing. But luckily, we live in an advanced age. With modern tools, we can get a glimpse inside of a healthy individual's brain, monitor their brain activity, and even decode it to understand what it all means just by putting a few electrodes on their head. But what if we could use this technology to not only understand the activity in our minds, but actually change and improve that activity? Well, if that were possible, we might just be able to enhance our brain's performance on demand. Now, to understand how this might be possible, we need to quickly review a term that you likely heard in your first psychology class, Operant Conditioning Now, Operant Conditioning is a theory of learning proposed by B.F. Skinner in the late 1930s. At its core, it basically just describes how animals learn through feedback. So whether we receive reinforcements or punishments, we learn through our actions what to do and what not to do. For example, in Skinner's experiments with pigeons, he taught them to read signs and follow directions just to receive a food reward. Now, of course, a more relatable example, assuming that you don't train pigeons, is when we use a punishment and reward system to train dogs to be more obedient or perform tricks. Now, around the early 1960s, a researcher named Dr. Sturman attempted to combine operant conditioning and EEG brain imaging to see what would happen. He found that the cats in his lab could be trained to increase their brain waves at a specific frequency when rewarded with food. Now, this was an exciting breakthrough, 
but was quickly forgotten as he started to pursue other projects. But a few years later, Dr. Sturman was doing an experiment for NASA on whether rocket fuel caused seizures. And during his study, he found that the cats who had previously undergone his brain training were significantly less likely to experience seizures than the other cats. So Sturman didn't only show that we could use operant conditioning to change the brain's activity, but he showed that by doing so, it could have some profound benefits. Now, after this discovery, the human applications began to build momentum as it was successfully used to treat epilepsy, ADHD, and other cognitive conditions. And these days, it has grown beyond the medical setting to even help top performers, business professionals, and athletes to train their brains towards better performance. And while it hasn't become a staple of esports yet, it's obvious how brain training can have a massive effect on ambitious players. It's the equivalent of advanced physical training that can help professional athletes to run faster, execute skills better, and ultimately perform at the highest level. But over the past 50 years, as interest, research, and application of neurofeedback has grown, it has also been matched with some criticism about its effectiveness. So it's worth asking how effective it really is and how much it can actually be applied to esports. So essentially, to understand if neurofeedback really is a powerful tool that can give us an advantage in esports, or if it's just a false hope, we first need to understand what to look for in the research. And so I reached out to Glenn, a cognitive neuroscientist who broke down exactly how to identify reliable versus unreliable research. Neurofeedback's been around for a while, um, more, than, more than 50 years, and there's a lot of research out there, but there's still a lot to do. <laughs> there are some, some key criticisms of the research that's been done. It's, it's ideal if you can have um, an active control group that you can compare to the neurofeedback group, where what the active control group is doing is as similar to neurofeedback as possible, but it's not neurofeedback, and then show that, that the neurofeedback has a specific benefit compared to that active control group. Subjective symptoms are often the most important outcome because you want the, the individual to feel that they've gotten better subjectively, but they're often criticized as an outcome uh, because the individual is biased. Right? You'd like to believe that you're doing better. Um, so things like a continuous performance task, a CPT, is considered an objective behavioral measure of performance improvement. Here Glenn mentions two essential things. The first is having a placebo control group. Without it, we can't really identify if it's neurofeedback causing the benefits. Now the second key factor is having an objective measure of performance. While someone might feel like they're improving or even feel like they're not improving, it might not actually line up with their results. So we need a performance task to measure actual improvement. Now, the unfortunate truth with a lot of neurofeedback is that these factors are often missing. And without a control group or a performance task, it's hard to rely on the conclusions of that research. And this is why so much of the research in neurofeedback has been criticized in the past. But fortunately for us, neurofeedback, especially related to improving performance, does have some quality research. I took the liberty of pulling what I consider uh, the best, most comprehensive review of optimal or peak performance studies in neurofeedback. This is a study from 2014 from John Griselier. And in that review, um, he um, talks about 23 studies in healthy participants that report evidence of neurofeedback learning along with beneficial outcomes. And you can see a list there of um, you know, of the types of outcomes that have been linked to successful neurofeedback in peak performance. And it's, it's quite a list. Uh, sustained attention, working memory, mental rotation, motor procedural learning, psychomotor skills, fluid intelligence, and anxiety and performance. In the field of peak performance, there seems to be much more consistent and, and stronger evidence for the benefit of, of neurofeedback. So the evidence of neurofeedback is obvious for improving many areas of our brain performance, from sustained attention all the way through to better working memory and far more. But as we comb through this research, I noticed a lot of it was tied to a very specific type of neurofeedback called SMR neurofeedback. 
and I wondered how training one specific brainwave could have so many benefits. And Glenn's explanation for this was pretty inspiring. And what the, the authors of the review conclude in terms of SMR and why SMR is effective, inhibiting somatosensory and sensory motor processing. And, and, and in, in doing that, conscious processing is reduced and automatic processing is increased, leading to superior sport performance. So you kind of go to automatic mode, you, you, you kind of bring yourself into an automatic, more automatic pilot mode uh, when you do the SMR enhancement training. Like I guess a big term in sports is getting into the zone. Is that more or less what it helps them to do? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So training this specific type of brainwave may ultimately teach our brains how to get into the zone or into a flow state. And if you've seen any of our past videos on this topic, you'll understand how amazing this is. But this really just scrapes the surface. There are several different types of neurofeedback that may work in other completely different ways, targeting different brain waves in different locations of the brain and leading to entirely different benefits. And this is why neurofeedback has been adopted by so many top performers. In fact, it's already being used by NASA astronauts, Olympic gold medalists, and football clubs like AC Milan and Real Madrid. And these are just a few examples. And of course, in esports, where the main factor for success isn't physical fitness, but mental fitness, it's obvious how much more potential it has here. But in the context of esports, is neural feedback just a nice to have, like an extra bonus? Or is it necessary if players want to succeed? Well, remember when I brought up the concept of operant conditioning and how it's used to train pigeons and dogs to do specific tasks? Well, operant conditioning isn't limited to other animals. It's a critical part of how we learn as well. As an example, think back to when you were learning to ride a bike. You're sitting there on the bike, trying to balance and ride forward, but of course, you're struggling and falling. And as you keep falling and trying again and again, you feel frustrated as if you're not making any progress. But inside your brain, a lot is happening. With every attempt, your mind makes new calculations and learns from the operant conditioning. Every time you make a physical adjustment and a mental calculation, you either receive the sensation of balance as a reward or the feeling of falling as a punishment. And through enough practice in trials like this, your brain eventually learns how to maintain optimal balance. Now during neurofeedback, your brain is trying to do the exact same thing. Most neurofeedback will give you a cue to let you know when your brain waves are at an optimal level, making you feel rewarded. Then when your brain leaves that optimal state, it will let you know, making you feel punished. And over time, your brain learns to make the right corrections consciously and subconsciously, as it did when you learned to ride a bike. And with enough training, your brain learns how to maintain balance and snap into an optimal mental state at any time. But when learning to ride a bike, what would happen if you never got the punishing sensation of falling or the rewarding feeling of balance? For example, let's say you're trying to learn how to balance on a two-wheeled bike by riding one that has three wheels. Since it does all the balancing work for you, you would never get the conditioning feedback. And no matter how hard you try to keep your body in the center of that three-wheeled bike, you'd still never learn how to properly balance. And this is kind of what happens with our brains. Since we don't get immediate feedback when we are falling out of focus or losing the optimal brainwave patterns, we can never really learn how to balance our brains, at least not to their best ability. And this is why neurofeedback has so much potential. It can give our brains immediate feedback as it goes in and out of that optimal state of mind and finally allows us to learn balance. And for this reason, and this reason alone, I really believe that it is an indispensable tool that all serious esports will begin to use. Since it's not that popular right now, it is just a nice to have, but it's not going to be like that for much longer. You see, as of right now, neurofeedback is a secret or a mystery to most esports players. They don't even know it exists yet. But 
since it has so much potential, why is it not the standard yet? Well, until recently, the barrier to entry was pretty high. If you didn't want to buy clinical level equipment, but wanted to spend a few months training your brain, you would actually have to go to a clinic multiple times a week and pay four to five thousand dollars for a 30 session program. And for a team of five esports players, that means spending upwards to twenty thousand dollars. But now, thanks to more recent innovations, we can get twice as many sessions in the comfort of our own home for a fraction of that cost. And quite honestly, it's still expensive for an average player. But it's a no-brainer for someone who's planning to make money throughout their entire esports career. And for that reason, I believe that neurofeedback is about to explode into the world of esports. And those who catch the trend early will get the greatest advantage. Hey guys, if you want to hear more about neurofeedback, I recently posted a full conversation with the neuroscientist Glenn on our second channel. The link for that will be in the description below. And if you are serious about trying it out for yourself, you can actually check out the brain training that we can now offer on the website. We've basically partnered with the company that Glenn works for to help bring it into esports. Now admittedly, it's expensive for an average player, but for the select few of you who are playing competitively or are on a team right now, I highly recommend it. Neurofeedback is kind of a hidden gem that's on the verge of exploding in esports, so any high level player who gets to it first will obviously have a pretty significant advantage. Now, if you're still trying to get to that competitive level and want to rank up a lot faster, then I'd recommend checking out our Esports Elite course in Coaching Plans. Over the past few months, we've just been racking up amazing results for the people that we're coaching, and there's even a lot more video testimonies that are now on the website. So if you want to see what kind of results and things you can expect, then I highly recommend checking out those reviews. Now, of course, the links for everything, including the neurofeedback and the Esports Elite course are going to be in the description down below. So don't forget to check those out. But as always, I hope you guys keep on grinding, keep on improving, and I'll see you all in the next video.